But they said no, you can't. No, they said, yeah, they said I can't trust their anything. Okay. This can't be a good thing. You've got a mess that you need, like, some... Okay. Yeah. I'm going to get the Nogi from the Alright, so my, uh, my computer is channeling... This Mac is channeling DOS. Which is pretty bad. Among, among the three, you know, Bill Gates, right? Good guy's having a little bit. He did make control alt delete very fast. Instead of keys. Mac made it simpler, right? One button, right? To turn it off. All right, so uh, suboptimal delivery systems. Okay, so uh, I started on this a little bit the other day. It's up on the screen. All right, so uh, yeah, we're going to have uh, small scale stuff, optimal branching. Right, so you again, this is very relevant to who you are it's sitting inside you right now. There's little optical branches that are doing the job. Uh, it is kind of ridiculous to have a heart beating for you know, a lot of many, many years, which, which we seem to do. Uh, single source. So, this will actually harken back to some of you have seen this, right? This is, I mean, it will expand upon what you've seen before. This is the three quarter law stuff. Um, I'm gonna Get rid of all the extra fun that we added <laughs> on top of that. It was a sort of a CSI investigation into a, uh, someone killing a theory, theory aside. Okay, we, we, we're going to simplify that, but, uh, you know, the extra piece, but uh, there'll be some nice extra complications in the way tubes taper and so on. And then we get these distributed sources and really just lots of interesting things in here, right? So this is a you know, moving through a sequence, right? So it's going to be uh, just a, about branches to start with, very micro and local. Then it's going to be about one source to many uh, sinks, or one sink, or many sources to one sink. And then uh, about many sources and many sinks. Right. Okay, these guys are still helping. Maybe they would be better tech support than me. Okay. All right. So, distributing stuff. I want to move stuff around, right? Letters, you know, that old... US post thing, it still exists. Um, of course, we're you know, texts, and which none of you are doing, right? No. Um, email, and all these sorts of things. So we have to, there, there are all sorts of complications there because then you have lots of things interweaving and overlaying each other. And telephone, right? You have chopping of, of, of voice in between, multiplexing, pretty extraordinary. Uh, this is going to be really, you know, we'll be able to think about physical stuff here, okay? Physical space. So a couple of problems, as I said. So single source to, to many sinks, right? Many sources to many sinks, and that's when we're getting to this section. Uh, and then, so there could so there could be many sources to many sinks. That's just a sort of a one way thing, if you like. And then redistribution. So the nodes are both sources and sinks, right? So you're sending letters between each other, or calling each other, or you're traveling, right? Getting on planes, having a lot of fun, suffering on planes, and but you. You know, you want to think, what's the cost of being in an airport versus flying? So you can get anywhere in the U.S. pretty much free flights, pretty much. That's pretty good, given it's not an all-to-all -all network, right? Right. That's that's a that's a well-done thing. Um, so these are uh, right. So you can think about supply and collection as being mirror images of each other. All right. So here's a very basic kind of. Uh, I'll set up for a lot of kinds of distribution or spreading things. Uh, so there's some cost, and then we'll see this for this little impedance guy. So there's some cost, so there's some impedance, or there's some resistance to stuff that's flowing through. It could be traffic, right? Thing. There's some cost, maybe it's your psychological burden of sitting in, on the, uh, on the um, uh, what is it? The, um, no, the bridge, the George Washington Bridge, <laughs> um, yelling at Christie. Or, uh, so there's that. There's some cost, you know. But if it's stuff maybe moving through a tube, that's that's clear. If it's uh, you know, electrons uh, jumping around, they you know, a lot of heat and so on. So there's okay. So uh, this is the current here, and this is one sort of generalization of you can imagine different things. But there, are, uh, this is a sum over all of the uh, little segments in this network. Right? J indexes over all the little pipes. Right? The internet is a series of pipes. I believe. <laughs> Um, tubes. Sequence of tubes. Wait, so this is over the links? Yeah, so this is the sum of the links. So, uh, right, so there's some uh, impedance story here, which is usually has to be a geometric thing. There's something about the geometry, right, so we'll see that for a couple of examples. 
Uh, it's something that should be measurable about the geometry. Uh, okay, you know, the, the material itself. Okay, and, and, and current, right? How much stuff is, is trying to squeeze, squeeze across the bridge? So you see, so for instance, uh, gamma is two for uh, electrical circuits. Right? Big fans of electrical engineering out there? Care about it? Yeah? Yeah, okay, good. So, uh, so, we, so we have V equals IR, right? We'll see this, because you have a, right? And then power is I squared R, right? This is the classic uh, kind of setup. Uh, or different versions of this, but basically, yeah, okay, right? So it goes up as a square of power. All right, but you can imagine generalizations. And so here's a, a nice little, it was gamma here, right? So it's going to be exploded here. Uh, this is some nice work by uh, Maniasco. So we remember, so Maniasco made the crazy uh, video of eroding landscapes. It's a completely different thing. He works on all sorts of stuff. Like bird songs, for example, where they take apart birds and find out how they sing. <laughs> um, yeah, but you know, and they really do find out. Hearing, he's done some really Super interesting stuff with hearing. Very different, right? Our eyes are like cameras. I mean, we make cameras very much after our eyes, and they just kind of reflect what's out there. But hearing is a very different thing. All right. So what I'm saying is this guy is from plastic. Uh, he's at Rockefeller still. Uh, he does lots of good things. All right. So here's a paper. I'll just show you a few little papers at the start of interesting things. So um, again, you know, large-scale things are hard to simulate. So this is trying to, uh, this is, in this case, it's a source to many things. Yeah, single source trying to supply this whole grid. And this is a case where gamma is greater than one. So this is uh, getting towards, if you like, electrical-like uh, distribution. And you see, you start to see braiding in that case, right? So electrons kind of, to get to one point, they'll go, they'll go lots of different ways. Yeah. And in some, in, in very nice ways, we'll get to this later on, um, uh, the way our current works for electrical circuits is a lot like random walking stuff. Uh, so much goodness in randoms. All right. Uh, and gamma less than one, so now uh, the current isn't so much of a cost, right? We're actually, the cost, so things like this, the cost, gamma is greater than one, so it, that's a, the, it's increasing super linearly with current. So there's a, it hurts you, right, to go up higher and higher in current, right? There's a, there's a problem, yeah? So uh, that, that pushes you, uh, pushes you away from having, uh, you know, big, uh, very concentrated flow. So that's why you get this kind of braiding. When it's less than one, it's super, it's sublinear, so you know, there's a nice returns to scale there, right? So uh, if you start to see just a pure branching structure, this is a very nice transition. So gamma is one is the transition between these two things. And these are just two examples. This is the, uh, like a global minimum that's been computed, right, over, this is kind of fun analytically, but it's been computed by just hammering a machine to pieces until it produces the best one. This is one that's grown, if you like, right? So it's been produced from a algorithmic. It's found, it's dynamically accessible. So the thing about this is it's accessible. We talk about this with systems, it's dynamically accessible. Could, you know, there's an ontogeny that you could see, it could, you could get to that. This is sort of the super duper one, which you'd have to do some sneaky stuff to, to get to, right? It's a hard place to get to. Right? This is from many, many simulations, which evolution or whatever your natural system isn't doing, right? It's just making a thing. I'm gonna make London. It's going to be a thing, right? It's going to have all sorts of historical problems, right? Um, yeah, you know, well, Boston. Let's make Boston. Let's you know, like put ridiculous roads everywhere, and then now we're going to dig it all out. You know, it's kind of a crazy, messy thing. It's hard to, you know, what's the what's the optimal story for for Boston? It was not really figured out. But, you know, the things grow. So, um, okay. So, and there's some work earlier by uh, Bonavar and L, which had a similar kind of story to it. This transition between. Braided flow, so this is a nice thing. This is a nice general result, right? So, okay. Um, some nice work by Jacques, who's a pure mathematician who was at UC Davis, at least, uh, last time I checked. Um, <laughs> may have been signed by a different university. Um, right? It's like, like um, Okay, so this is, they're, they're, I can't tell you all the details behind this, but the idea is there's a whole, uh, there's an, actually an infinite kind of recursion up here uh, there's a there's a whole um, you know set of sources here or sinks depending on how you've done it. But this is a set of sources and there's a sink here, right? So it's a, you're going from a 1D kind of structure. The flow is coming off that and having to go to a zero-dimensional piece. So 
And depending on, so there's some, so this has some of that structure in there, right? There's some reward to being in, to joining current up, right? Slightly different, but he has that kind of idea. There's no underlying network here, right? This one had an underlying network on which to sort of choose your path. Here it's just a big, it's just a 2D plane. And so the optimal solution here you see is that, yeah, it, they form, if you go in here there's all this re infinite recursion, but uh, very quickly form uh, single streams or 1D kind of structures, and then there's returns to, to um, joining up, so they do. This is from uh, a, a source and a sink, they're sort of located in a different, there's a different measure on these. Um, and so you get that same kind of thing. It actually benefits them to join up and then pop out the other. It's a problem I kind of thought about for years, actually, on and off, thinking it would be nice to solve. And the world provided answers to it by other people doing it, which is good. So science, right? Um, whereas if you could you could tune this uh, this parameter for current, for example, this this exponent, and you would just have bulk flow, right? So it would just go. There's, there's, if you like, there's, there's a little flow coming over here. You can imagine there's a big pool here, and it's just spilling over this edge, and the, get a return to, to joining up, so it does. But you can imagine it actually could just flow as a sheet, which it would if, uh, if there wasn't any benefit to joining up. Okay, if you get a return, it, it's actually good to join up. You don't, it doesn't cost as much, right? Does that make sense? To me? Uh, this is jargon, did uh, a bunch of other things. This is a little growing situation. So, uh, as I recall, the way he did this was just to imagine it buds, and then uh, it will find the next best place to put a, a little um, a branch, and so it carries on, carries on, and it produces you know, leaf like shapes, which is quite nice. So, ontogeny is in there. Um, yeah, this is funny. This is an interesting piece of work because it's a mixture between very mathematical measure theory business, like all sorts of good stuff like that, and then, you know, some good, uh, good simulations. Um, so that's a lot of fun. And so depending on the, the parameters, you get different kinds of leaves, right? And then you might be able to go and say, oh, you know, this makes sense for this tree, this tree, this tree. Um, leaves, of course, very interesting things, right? So you have this, pre, this 3D branching structure of a tree, and then you turn it into leaves, and they're little flat 2D branching structures. So you go from you know, this tube, tube to a little flat tube, and then there's a whole how they're arranged in space to get as much sunlight and so on. It's pretty, you know, other things trees. There's phyllotaxis, which is this beautiful thing. Oh, so. This beautiful tax, uh, <clears throat> not skiing. Okay, so there's uh, uh, you know, beautiful uh, work on uh, how buds works, how uh, flooding works as things grow. Nice um, Fibonacci sort of story in, uh, in swirls and all sorts of things. Okay. Uh, very interesting. So here's another example um, with the comparison with real leaf. Uh, leaves actually do have, uh, they connect. So they, they're not actual pure branching. So they loop. They loop. Uh, so in fact, you can cut out. This is actually, I saw Manasco do this. They uh, had students from Stuyvesant. So you cut out a piece in here, and the leaf will still function. Not so good for us. <laughs> or if you do that to the George Washington Bridge. That's bad. People will get very upset. Okay. Okay, we talked about this. Like, what's the, is it, are, are these networks optimal? That's a big kind of question. Are they optimal? Um, you know, how are they made? Are they just sort of, just adequate enough, and they robust in some sense that you know we don't die, so they're pretty good, right? Because evolution is producing things that optimize them in a different, a number of different dimensions, quite distinct ones. Uh, we do see these self-similar structures all over the place, so that's just one straight-up observation. And of course, we know about this Tokunaga thing and so on. Um, so the scale, this, the scaling relations are there. I showed you those things for hack exponents and these different things, right? For, power law size distributions for lengths and areas. And so those things all match up, and it depends on the, the network itself. So this is just a little reprisal of the end of the last sort of slide. Uh, so it may be that scaling is just the thing you need, right? So you need some genetic kind of little algorithm sitting in there that says, let's build a blood network, and it's going to have 
scaling, and, and we have a, you know, a simple way of doing it, right? So we can make another branch, another branch, right? So it's easy to build, um, and it's really the overall scaling that matters, but not exactly the detail. Um, okay, so we had these, these pieces. We talked about these. Um, okay. So, you know, they're big stories. They're competing. No one has a really great one here, but Murray's, Murray's law seems to work. So let's, uh, let's see if you can see this. Guy. Very nice. So it's a very peculiar little relationship. You might not expect this at all, right? So it's the so here's you as I said. So we're thinking about the blood networks out at the in the outer reaches of your blood system, right? So where the getting towards the where the capillaries are, capillaries, getting out to that those parts, and the blood is slowing down and it's flowing smoothly usually once you're really going berserk. But they're flowing. It's flowing pretty smoothly even so. Because uh, it has to stop at the, has to slow down enough to exchange some stuff that the, the blood, the, uh, the blood cells have to do some little exchange, right? So they can't be racing through the station. Otherwise, it's like ah, I'm trying to catch a thing and they miss, right? So there's a that that has to happen. Um, okay, so let's see if you can, can you see these things, right? So there are there's a this is the parent uh, tube and these are the offspring ones if you like. So you can imagine flow is coming down here. Uh, so the a naught for this one and uh, one and two. So we have uh, there's a length L1, a length L2, R2 here and R1 are the radii. There's some flow that's the um, P0 there and P1 and P2. So that's the stuff per unit time. So it's volume per unit time, right? How much stuff is going through? Excitement? No. It's fun to draw these kinds of tubes. All right, so. Uh, lots of evidence that this works for uh, for us and for you know, other vertebrate type characters and trees. So it's this cube relationship. So the the, the cube of this guy and this. So there isn't a you know a two here or a one point one or a pi or something. It's cube. It's really the, the sum of right. The sum of these two cubes equals this one. Yes. And this is from the both directions or just that way. So the idea is, um, yeah, we'll be thinking about flow through one thing, but for arterial, that's true, and then for the venal one, it'll be going the other way. I think it's in, it's independent. The calculation should be independent. Well, that's why. But it's basically that this the amount of stuff coming through here has to equal the sum of these things. Yeah. yeah. So it's going to be true the other way. So I don't think there's any direction. Yeah. So it's the outer branches. So links to these things. Anyone? Darcy Thompson. You ever heard of this guy? So, famous polymath, uh, his beautiful books um, on growth and, growth and form. Um, you know, not everything is right at all, but it's a lot about, uh, you know, written a long time ago. Uh, I think it's, um, right, but I think it's uh, early 1900s or late 1800s. And, sorry if I'm wrong there. But uh, just, so, you, know, here, you know, here are snail shells and all those sorts of things, right? Here are these shapes in here. So what's the, are they the result of some optimal kind of story? And so one of the pieces he had in there was, uh, was this, an argument about um, this branch. It's a very fun book, lots of beautiful drawings, very, very good. Stuff. All right, recommended. Okay. All right, so, this is not a fluid dynamics class. Yes? So was there any kind of like, geometry that was any other kind of book for that? Or? Yeah, yeah, well, so we'll do it. Let's do it. Yeah. Sorry. Everything will be backed up by truth. Okay. Well, I will try. All right. Okay, so let's see if we can uh, derive that. Okay, so hopefully you can see this okay. This is a, let me explain it. So there's some pressure at this end, pressure at this end. There is a velocity profile if you look at the fluid in here. Right? And so it's flowing faster in the middle, is the idea of this. Uh, and, then, and then at the edge, Fluid mechanics, we love this thing in fluid mechanics, so there's a so-called no-slip condition. So that there's, if you're right at the edge, nothing's moving. Right, right? If you look right at the edge, there's nothing moving very fast. Okay? Right? So we say it's zero here. So if you have those assumptions, you can drive, you get a parabolic form for this, and this is Poiseuille flow, and it works. This is true in the case of smooth flow of fluid in a tube. Right? So a closed in tube. So it's a famous uh, famous uh, result. Um, so we have the change in pressure, okay, and that has to be, so there's a change in pressure across here, and that's going to be equal to the um, current, if you like, which is the, 
exclude the volume per unit time times the impedance, or some measure of impedance. Right, so there's a resistive, so the, the fluid is being resisted by the tube, right, the tube walls, and then also by itself. This is a tricky part of fluid mechanics, right, that fluid is being resisted by, right, so honey flows in a certain way and air flows in a certain way. There's a viscosity, right? So what Z is? Z is the, um, for this tube, is going to be an overall thing. Viscosity is a term that applies to the fluid in general. Okay. It's about, right, there's some shearing, like how much it likes being next to itself. Um, and so here are, the, here are our words, right? So it's Poiseuille impedance, or Poiseuille flow is the story. Uh, and so we have a tube of length L and radius R. This is the impedance. So this is where the geometry... You can go and figure out how to derive this. This is a whole other thing, right? We need to know the Navier Stokes equations and all sorts of goodies. But uh, the pieces that, that are in here, there's a dynamic viscosity, which is so this is, this is a fluid-specific right, thing. And so we have that for blood. Um, depends on how much McDonald's you've eaten, I guess. You just want to do this up and down a little bit. <laughs> um, depends on your culture, right? Yeah. right. So, uh, actually, I wonder what the variation is like. Yeah. Okay, all right. All right, high blood pressure. What's that? Something I read a few days ago, and someone asked a question about if you eat healthy with the cholesterol, does your veins, do your veins actually clear up? Oh, does it go back the other way? Does it not so if you eat healthy foods for a while, eventually your body just reabsorbs the cholesterol again. Uh, Which it does or it doesn't? It does. Okay. It does this, so it does I mean, really cholesterol is good stuff, right? But I mean, you need a bit of it. It's, a, it's actually... Yeah. Yeah. Zero cholesterol is not good. There's a flaw in cholesterol. <laughs> no one ever talks about it because we're not really accessing that <laughs> end of the range anymore. But, um, yeah, it's, yeah, you make it. You, know, you make your cholesterol. Um, you can get it from prosciutto, but you have to make it yourself. I can also make it yourself. Uh, <clears throat> I know, it's like we should get rid of all of them. Um, you would die. Okay, so uh, let's see, how does this guy work? It works in a reasonable way. So it, the longer the tube is, the more impedance, the, the more the impedance grows, right? So you're trying to push the stuff through, and there's some cholesterol holding up, right? You're trying to push it through. Uh, that's going to increase as, long as the tube. And this is where the cholesterol piece is, actually. It's out of the fourth on the bottom, right? So as the radius gets smaller, the impedance goes up. So this is a bad, it's out of the fourth. So you know, it's cholesterol, to, I'm not, I can't say that. But the cholesterol, is if, if it's, you know, it, it reduces the radius by, you know, so, so much percent, right, brings it down to whatever, then that, that factor will appear as a fourth power here. Yeah, it's not good. It's, uh, anus is, down. What's that? it's not prosciutto. His dynamic viscosity, is it a derivative of something? Or you're just saying that eta... This guy, this is, yeah, okay, so it's a quantity that's measured, that can be measured for, so this is a very nice, this is this great, you know, complexity story, right? This is something that can be measured, it's a property of the, of the fluid. You go measure for air, for honey, for honey made in Vermont, for honey made in Texas. <laughs> Little variations, but it's very different, of course, to, flu, uh, to water, to see what, you know, so, yeah, it's a property of the fluid. But the equations that you use then to model them, the Navier Stokes equation. That doesn't change the parameter. Okay. And you have to make approximations. Air will be different, you know, if, if turbulent sort of flow is different. So, or, you know, it becomes very hard. But in principle, this is just a property you can measure of the, yeah. You know, and it's to do with how sticky the thing is, right? How much it so likes to be next to itself. So what's MLP? So this is, it, the units of this are mass oh. divided by length divided by time, right? Uh, Which okay. depends on what you want. Right, it could be parsecs, kilograms, whatever you like. Stones, stones, stones. <laughs> Anyone know what a stone is? A lot. What's a stone? Oh, is that right. a British thing? Is it like 16 pounds? Close, it's 14. Right. Oh, okay. Why would it be 16? <laughs> <laughs> 16 ounces in a pound, and 14 <laughs> pounds in a stone. So you would actually, so like humans, you know, in England and places like Australia, you talk about how many stones you weigh. Well, it's sort of that. So you'd say you weigh a certain amount of pounds. Because then you've got something that's got a, it's a it's a smaller number, right? So you can talk about twelve or thirteen or fourteen stone or ten stone. I thought that that didn't help though. Like, when I thought it's in, like kilogram, in kilograms and I mean, you know, it gives you another thing, right? Because instead of being one hundred and fifty or two hundred and thirty or four hundred pounds, you know, like they're all good things. Okay. No. Okay. This is awesome. 
it just got lost, I, I guess. Anyway, so um, the nice thing about the, those ridiculous kind of English, European kind of measurements, oh, except, of course, you know, the metric thing comes out of Europe as well, but I mean the, the traditional ones. No, no, you're right, that's also ridiculous. It is also absolutely ridiculous, but they're really, they, they, you have to think, you have to concentrate. 22 yards in a furlong? Great. I mean, we do have good American ones too, like smooths. Smoots, we have the smoots, which I am very familiar with. We're talking about this. Okay. Units of measurement, very fun. But the, so the smoot, this is a bit unfortunate, but this fellow was the smallest, shortest guy in, uh, in his fraternity coming into his MIT fraternity. So the, this is a very obnoxious actually. The bridge from MIT across to Boston is called the Harvard Bridge. <laughs> but this guy was forced to uh, lay down and lay down and lay down, and so there's a there's a number of smoots that that, that bridges, and it's repainted. So you, if you ever walk across it, you'll see the smoot number. So it's so many and so many, you know, and, and uh, like one sixth of a smoot. Let's see, look this up, uh, George Smoot, I think. Anyway, so he's a pretty famous guy, I think, um, and he may now be in charge of like that big statistics bureau kind of. In his like position. Measures. Yeah, so he's actually <laughs> worked out for him. Um, if you put it into Google, you can put, you know, three miles equals how many smoots, and it will tell you. It's a unit of measurement that Google has put in its <laughs> system. Are oh, there really good ones? Yeah, 22 yards is good. That's actually the length of a cricket pitch, and same with uh, baseball, right? It's the distance from the pitcher to the... Is that right? The mound to the batter? No, that's the best part. 60, that's the 66. So. Okay, there you go. Yeah, <laughs> Three times 22. <laughs> Fantastic. Yeah. That was a pearl. Really crazy. Anyway, but the thing is you have to think in really interesting, you know, I mean, you're counting these things as fun. It's the, uh, the, when you go back in time, it's the uh, Sumerians who really nailed it. I think Sumerians and maybe some of the others, Babylonians, right? 60. 60 was the unit was the system, which 60 is a great number, it's so much better than 10, because you can divide, the, that's why we have 60 seconds, and 368, right, I mean those numbers are really terrific numbers, and aliens would figure this out, right, the octopuses I'm sure know about 60, right, and 720 is great, these are really good numbers, because you can divide them evenly, and, and there are, this is actually, I forgot the name of this, but this is actually a thing, right, so 12 and then 24, maybe then... Well, certainly 120. These are, as you go up, these are the numbers that have the most integer divisors uh, you know, compared to the ones before, right? So primes are obviously hopeless, right? It would be terrible to have 61 seconds in a minute. But 60 is really good. You can divide it up, right? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. But misses 7, but gets 6. And, yeah. Anyway, all right. That's a diversion because of your question. I blame it on myself. Okay, so... Okay, so this matters. Uh, all right, so uh, power. So it's going to be that same kind of thing before. So we had current squared times impedance was the thing we opened up with. So that's, uh, that's the drag associated or the power associated with, well, this is the, how much um, energy per unit time is being used up to pump stuff through this, this tube. All right, so it depends on the fluid. We're, not gonna say, we're actually not going to say anything about the, you know, it could be a, so it could be made out of concrete, it could be made out, right, the, the wall, we're not really going to say anything about it, except that the fluid is exactly um, stationary against it, it's not moving against it. So that's just, the, that is the big assumption in this thing, and it's generally true. And as you go away, from, so the fastest flow is in the middle. So does that make sense, this is the velocity profile, right, so this is the speed of this uh, particle here, and the speed of the particle here is zero, and it has a parabolic chain. Okay, famous. All right. Okay, so so that's one piece of this. So we have that cost, and we also have um, the the metabolic cost. You can imagine for having this bit of blood inside you, right? You have to keep it kind of functioning and refurbished and so on, right? Hanging around, making more blood cells. So that's just going to be the volume times some cost ratio, right? Okay. So that's how much blood you have in here. It's, you know, it's pi r squared times l. We throw out pi away and just put in a, a little cost guy here. So this is growing simply as volume, right? Radius goes up, it costs more to keep that blood around. Length goes up, it, keeps, it costs more as well. Uh, fair enough, so we have these two things. And you can see, so length is going up here, but the, these, the uh, R's, the radii are going in different ways. Right? So it's more cost, so smaller, 
smaller R, you know, less cost to run the thing, but it's going to be um, harder to push it through. All right. All right, so this is a, so we sort of talked a lot about these different things, but this is a, a drag. So in, in general, you can, you can think about this in different ways. So work done, force times distance, right? Here's the force you've had to use to move something over a distance. Um, power is the rate that, that work is being done, so differentiate the distance if you like. It, you, it's a velocity thing now. Um, let's see, so, and so pressure is force per unit area, so this is trying to just connect all these things. It's force per unit area. This guy is um, how much volume of the fluid per unit time is moving, which you can think of as cross-sectional area times velocity, right? We'll take, uh, we'll take the area and then we'll take the little distance this way. And um, so if, if we multiply these two guys together, we get force times velocity, right? This unit area here is canceling this piece. Right? Per unit area is canceling this piece, so it's force times velocity. So it has that, this guy has the right feel. This is good to go back to kind of a mechanics story if you're really, you like your balls rolling down things and right, it's a little bit of Newton stuff. This may this may feel familiar from that world. Okay. Um, yeah, and so right, so power is a problem. So if you ride a bike, then you want to know about these things because uh, drag goes up as velocity squared. Um, so it's it's bad. Okay, so let's add those things together and then we'll, we'll see if we can, after much talking, achieve uh, a, this uh, cube law. So we're going to add those two things together. Obviously, we're you know, totally making things up, but we've got the cost and we've got how much it, uh, how much uh, it, we're burning to just push it through, right? So we maintain the stuff and then we're going to move it somewhere. So those two pieces add up. Uh, so we had our impedance times the flux squared. So this is like current squared. This is again like uh, the I squared R thing. And then our piece, and I've highlighted the the uh, the, um, the geometric pieces that are involved, right? Where you something. So the power is going up with L, fair enough. R's effect is, is more complicated, right? So um, I said these things. So this is going down. This is it's better to have a large R. It's bad over here. It's bad to have a small R over here. So those two things will balance each other out. Okay. So let's see a little bit of. Partial derivative action. Uh, so we want to minimize it. Uh, you know, minimizing with respect to L is not silly because um, just want to chew a size. But you know, there's going to be a tube. So now we're going to talk about well, as a function of R, what happens. Let's look at that part. Okay, so derivatives, love these things. It's kind of crazy, right? So we get a four, so there's going to be a minus four here out of the fifth. This is just 2r, so that's good. It's kind of fun. Set this equal to 0. And we mess around with things. Okay. <laughs> mathematical procedure. Uh, so that r to the 5, you can see, is going to come up over here. There's a minus sign. I'm going to mess around with those things. This is going to make it r to the 6th over here. Uh, there's going to be a pi joining that c, so c pi r to the 6th. So the l's are going to cancel. And we're going to isolate this guy over here. We have our flux squared. Uh, and there's a 4 times 8, and there's a 2 over here, so 2 divided by 32 is 16. And we also have the this constant. Okay. okay. So that's just some, we'll call it some constant squared, and it's kind of nice to keep us, we could just make it k, but we'll put a square in there because lots of, we need to obviously take a square root at some point here. So the flux is really going to be proportional to the r cubed, so that's a little insane, but that, that comes out. We need to have this Poisson story, right? The 1 over r to the 4 looks pretty good. Because when you differentiate that, you get a 1 over r to the 5, and the other one goes to r. They become an r to the 6th. We had a 5, you know, flux squared. So, you know, this is sort of just math, right? Um, which doesn't always tell you a good story. Anyway, so, let's see. So now we have this, actually. So this, this comes out nicely. Um, of taking the square root of both sides. We go back to our little picture where the fluxes had to add together, right? The flux coming in through the parent tube, how they call the flux going out. <clears throat> yeah, so this works. This all works for the other thing. This is where we make the junction. This is where we connect the junction, right? right so we had our, yeah. Okay. Right, so we have our flux here. 
P0, P1, P2. And they have to add up because otherwise um, something bad is happening. Conservation of stuff. Um, and so if you add these guys up, right, so you get a, there's a, there's a K, that K is, you know, it has a pi, it's a universal thing, right? There's a pi in there, viscosity, that's not changing uh, depending on which tube we're in. Right? The thing that's changing as a function of tube is, is uh, just this R cubed. So uh, we end up with an R0 cubed here, an R1 cubed here, and an R2 cubed here, K, 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 they all disappear. So we have our cube loop. Yeah. Okay, so I'm going to try and think of a story for why this is true. <laughs> Which I probably should just know. Um, and then I can say it's obvious, which is how bad people do things. Okay. All right. So that's pretty good. And that, as I said, is empirically really well observed. Very nice. Yeah. yeah. You are sitting there with this R cube law happening right now. Um, and so, yeah, and just to sort of elaborate on that, right? So you've got the heart beating. Actually, up here, you have pulsatile flow, right? So the tube is actually A order, and then these big guys are actually they're dialing in and out. They're, they're spiraling in and out. They're not rigid tubes. Uh, and there's work by Wormersley in the 60s that really dealt with this horrible problem. You have elastic tubes. So you have to think about pressing, pushing something through that. So you get a different kind of impedance. It's pretty hairy. It's messy. It doesn't work out as well as this. Uh, but that flow is, is kind of a little messier too, right? And then once, but once you get out to the edges, it, it's, it's nice and relatively smooth. The puzzle story can be applied, and you get this... And so the flow is actually slowing down. That's a, it changes in the, the scaling changes. This, as I said, this doesn't apply up here. It doesn't apply around the heart. This doesn't actually hold. But it tends to wood as you go out. And it slows things down. All right. So that should make sense, right? You've got some sort of network. And then it starts to branch a bit faster. And that means things are going to slow down as they get out. Right? There's more, more room for them to get into. I mean, yeah. Okay, so we can connect uh, Murray and Topinaga. Uh, okay, good. Um, so now we have, now we have, you know, we have this bigger story. We know, yes, there's little junctions like this, and that would sort of work if it was a pure kind of big branching thing. But we might have to. This is this difficult thing with uh, with real blood networks and real. Uh, Branching networks, natural ones, is that we know there are all these little side guys in here, right? And they have different, have different. Uh, let's say the flow is like this, right? So that's going to be coming out here and out here and so on. So that's. I just like drawing tubes. Um, it's a blood hole. Okay. So. Uh, so yes, yeah, so we know we have this more complicated thing. So let's, so we could, we actually need to write this, we can write this thing, right? So the, the flux of this overall order omega branch is going to be equal to the two, these, right? I can draw a picture of this. This is an order omega one, these are omega minus one, omega minus one. That was our story, right? They join and they make an order omega one, and then we have all these side branches. So, uh, yeah, and we have a counting thing. We have our Tokunaga story. So the flux in this big guy has to equal two times the, two, the flux of the two uh, branches coming out at the end, and then all these little side branches are taking some of the flux on. So that has to all add up. So you can actually, uh, we, we have, this is a general result, right? This had nothing to do with branching. This is just about flow through a tube. Right? So the flux is proportional to some constant times R cube. We can stick all of that in there. And if we do that, the k's all disappear. So now we've got an expression for radii that we didn't have before. So this is a nice generalization. Of course, this is radii. Now we're in 3D, the river networks we didn't have. We didn't talk about the width of those things. We can, but we didn't do it. Um, right. And so you can get a Horton ratio, if you like, for, for uh, vessel radius. Right? So that'll be a little ridiculously, all these ratios have a big R, so there's a big R with a little R. Uh, and Actually, so you get the same equation that we did for um, uh, 
area, right? which now is volume. So we had area, base and area for networks, that's in a 2D space. Now we have volume. So the network comes up, comes out, and it sub, this, this feeds some volume, right? Some volume of network. Uh, so we actually get this collapse. So that's good. You know, we like to do this. We like to collapse these parameters and find you know, how many there are that are truly independent. Um, that's a nice little result. Um, the other one is the length one, and you can kind of connect the length one in as well, because now we're again in 3D. The argument is isometry, which is a little bit hairy perhaps, but uh, the volume, the volume of this guy, you know, is roughly proportional to the length of the main branch in here. So if you do that, then you get uh, a similar kind of thing. So again, you get the 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 branching or the growing rate, the ratio for uh, for length. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. All right. So this is just a little extra bit. Um, you get a similar result if you just use straight up Horton's laws, which, as we said, is not really telling you exactly what the architecture is like. Right? It, it implies a pure hierarchy. Um, the very controversial paper, which we talked about, some of you have seen in Parks. Some of you have not seen it. So if you're in the last box, we didn't do it, actually. But it's an extremely controversial paper. Um, had nine reviewers at science, and one person resigned from the board. So, uh, anyway, um, there's a kind of a bit of work with, uh, this is uh, Turcotte, um, and they, where they used a Tokenheiter argument to uh, connect somewhat to um, uh, connect these branching ratios. Anyway, and they had a, some data for a cat that had been taken apart. Yes? This was the West paper? Um, yeah. Yes. Yeah, we'll touch on it. I mean, I have the full thing laid out uh, in, in parks, and I really did it properly in the, in the previous season. But, yeah. Okay, so we're going to do move on to, so this is just, so we've looked at well, we've moved on a little bit. We went from just a little one branch, okay, one branching. Now we've sort of attempted to handle uh, a more sophisticated description of these guys. Um, I'm going to zoom through. Some of you have seen parts of this, but we're going to make it more complicated, and I'll give you a nice calculation to do. Uh, so, so a very simple thing. So we have one source, and we're in a d-dimensional volume. Now, this is hard for me to say, but we're in a... Um, we're in some big D dimensional volume, right? So for us, we're in 3D. We have, a, we have a heart supplying a 3D thing, right? And you can think of river networks as being the opposite story where you've got one sink, and that is draining out, you know, there are lots of drains, but it's draining out from a 2D um, space, and uh, it's big, the big D there is what I mean, it's two dimensional, right? So two dimensional space. Obviously, some ripples in it, but it's basically two dimensional. Uh, and <clears throat> so, so that is it's draining a, a little d equals two dimensional space, but river networks live in three dimensions, right? right? Things can get deeper. The difference, so so okay, river networks little d is two, big d is three. Right? It's a two d thing in three dimensions. For us, we have a little d equals three and big d equals three, right? So a blood network so provides to a three dimensional space. Which is in a three-dimensional space itself, right? right? So there's not an extra dimension to play around with, right? So rivers can get deeper in ways that we can't do with blood networks. Very important. Okay, so let's assume that the the uh, the density. These are the things. These are the sinks, right? So the density of the sinks can depend on volume. So if we think about cities, for example, you might imagine that as you get bigger, density changes in some way. It could be that. Uh, this could be made more complicated by saying, well, the density profile varies in a, in a way as well. It's dense in the middle, it dies off for us, so, you know, roughly the density is somewhat uniform as you go through. Different muscles and so on have different amounts of things. That's why you have uh, red and white meat, I think, for um, dark meat and, and white meat for uh, turkeys, because some of it's flying stuff, and some of it's just walking around stuff, and so one's more rope, more... Um, has more vessels because it runs on uh, blood a little more. Um, okay, so so there, you know, there are different densities as you go through. But let's just assume that 
it's really just a function of the overall size of the thing and its uniform. So a big, so an elephant might have a lower density of capillaries, but we'll sort of assume it's roughly, you know, randomly placed throughout. Elephant might not like that. Uh, whereas a mouse has a high density. Let's say, let's say, right? Um, all right. So we'll do something to our network. We'll imagine. Okay, so here's our heart beating away, and it's got three things to supply, and we we can. This helps us to break it up, and we'll say, well, actually, it is a, it is a series of tubes, okay. parallel tubes. And so um, this is something where we're not thinking about the returns to scale stuff of the Maniasco stuff that I showed you at the start, where there's some that, well, it'll be implicit in this geom geometric argument, but right, that, that it's beneficial for this blood to be kind of on the same, they're carpooling, right? Yeah, they're carpooling. And then some, gets off, some of it gets off here, and then they're like... Okay, so you can think of your favorite um, transportation device. Okay, I have a question. Snowmobiles. Yeah. So what do we mean when we say the sinks are invariant? So the sinks, so the sinks are, oh yeah, sinks are invariant. So that they are all similar, right? So that the capillaries are all similar kind of objects. So which is roughly true, right? So the capillary in an elephant is similar to one in a mouse. So the cells aren't very. It's not like the cells of elephants are. Elephant size compared to mouse size, <laughs> which is a pretty weird thing, right? So you take a cell out of an elephant and a cell out of a, a mouse, and you stick them in a petri dish, and you're like, which one is which, right? They're, they're similar, but there's actually different levels of mitochondria and all sorts of stuff. So, I mean, it's part of how it's grown. It's like, okay, I need more. Like, I'm just going to run at a bigger, you know, a faster rate on the mouse. I don't have long to live. I'm just going to get it done, and uh, I'm going to tick, 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 and the elephants. Are, so we're just saying if we increase the size of the network, the things remain the same. The sinks have the same kind of, yeah. So we can imagine if it's people in a city, and this doesn't really necessarily apply that, but they, you know, they have a similar kind of resource usage. Um, right, this could be houses, you know, you're setting up material. So that's actually quite true, right? Your electrical power is, you know, and the houses vary a little bit in how much they use, but not crazy. Fantastic, please ask questions. Do we conserve, always conserve flow in the network? Uh, yep, yep. It's being siphoned off, if you like, so it's being taken off at these points. Mm -hmm. But then once it returns back around again. So in this one, it's, it's actually being dissipated, right? So there's flow, yeah, but you could then put the, for us, you'd put another network on top. So, but in, you think of river networks as sort of being driven by rain. So there's, there's a big complicated way of, magic way that it all gets back up in the air, but <laughs> it's it's flowing, yeah, right, right. So you can but think I'm of saying, that. So, uh, but also between the nodes, I'm saying like some of it sinks through the ground too. Yeah, that's right. So we, you know, you, you kind of you, you talk for for capillaries, it kind of makes sense, right? But um, for uh, landscapes, you coarse grain it at some level, yeah. and there's some amount that's taken off in this section. All right. Yeah. So. Or flows in. Okay. Um, okay, so so here's so how many um, so how does the, the number and we can think of number of fraction but number number of sinks scale with volume v right so these these are kind of the similar sinks we're going to make bigger and bigger systems but we've got the, our big constraint is that we have a central uh, source right so we're not going to put another source out there like we're going to build a bigger dinosaur and put another brain out here and another heart out the back as well, right? We can do that, you know, it's cheating. Um, you've still got this one source in the middle. You can make it a bit bigger, but you've still got to, you know, deliver the stuff. So, you know, you're Walmart, you're spreading out from Arkansas, and you have to you know, make those things work, right? So, okay. So, another way to think about it is what's the highest scaling we could get, right? Alpha is some power here. What's the best thing we could do? It seems weird. It, it, it seems that it should be at least no more than one, right? should be able to do better as the whole thing gets bigger. So you think there's a cap there. Right. All right, so imagine uh, this is a, an elephant on the right and a mouse on the left. You have some family, we have to think about you have some family of shapes. Right? So these shapes are being scaled up. Uh, and then, so this, this omega, which is different to the omegas we had before, means um, uh, this shape, okay? And 
There's a heart in the middle of it, so that has some location. And there's some typical length scales. It has to be orange in some way. There's some scale here, some scale here. And uh, as we scale up through this family, these length scales can grow allometrically. Right? So it's not isometric. Maybe you just scale the thing up like you're zooming it in. Uh, this thing that doesn't work. Um, but it, this, this, in this case, it sort of appears that this is scaling up. So we're going to allow that as a very general principle, so that our elephant could be, you know, a mouse that's been stretched this way and stretched this way, this way this, right? or trimmed, whatever it is. Yeah. Okay. It's very, very nice, right? So you might want to think about: is it better to 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 fill shapes that are, you know, kind of stretching a little more, so more right? So you can imagine uh, we have three D, we have a three D thing. It starts off as like a little sphere. That's our mouse, and as it stretches, of course, we think of Spherical shaped cows, right? So, um, good physics approach. So, it's stretching in this way like a pancake, right? So, the idea is it's, if it's really growing fast in these two dimensions and very slowly in this dimension, then eventually as it gets bigger and bigger, it's like a big pancake with four legs. That would be the you know, one example of how this could change. But in general, we have this that each length scales as volume, the overall volume, to some power. And then those powers have to add up to one. So if it's isometric and we're in three dimensions, it will be a third plus a third plus a third. Length plus height plus width will be scaling, right? We have, we have a very nice spherical object. Um, they don't have to be spheres for it to be isometric, right? They could be oblongs, but they just grow isometric. Yeah. Careful with that. So if it's allometric, then at least two of them have to be Right? There's some change somewhere. Right. Uh, so we had for nails uh, something like three eighths and three eighths and a quarter, or was it three sevenths and three sevenths? And so it's in there, yeah, right. So there's some they they, um, they got thinner as they got longer. Yeah, okay. I always get confused about. That. And I should. Okay, uh, these are okay. So we're going to supply. We're going to have networks supplying uh, out, right? And we're going to think about it in this way. We'll just say, okay, here's our network. That's what it really looks like. But I'm just going to say, okay, it's a superposition of these three tubes. Right? There's really a tube that's kind of running directly to this one. It's just that they combine to make it a tube here. Um, okay, so these are the kind of obvious best and obvious worst situations. This is work by Banner Varel that we connect to this. Uh, so this is, yeah, there's some terrible thing where you go all over the place before you get to your, right? You can imagine, so you can compute what the scaling would be like this. Like this, this. What's that? Yeah. <laughs> Things have gone wrong. Um, yeah, so it, yeah, so this, you can imagine you're, you're, you're yeah, right, very, very secure. And you can think about what the worst scaling is, but we're not really interested in that limit because that's not. Um, so this is a pretty... I think this is an okay use of the word obvious. Um, the minimum volume that you need has to be proportional of the network, the volume of the network. Right? So the network is you know, it's, it's a sum of all of these tubes times their radius squared times a pi. Um, it has to be proportional to this. You know, this is the best you could do, is you have a direct path from everyone. And there must be some little bit of joining up, okay? Uh, so it'll be the sum of the distances from the sources to the sink. And so here's a nice piece. Uh, we'll come back to more work by these guys later on, Newman and uh, Gassner. It's a series of things. So some of this uh, stuff over here, uh, distribution of the, the supply networks, many-to-many -many stuff. Correct? I think so. Uh, so this is actually busting, right? So this is the commuter rail network. So the T is in the middle, and then this is a commuter rail network for Boston. Um, right? So they all come in and watch the stuff we all lose. Lots of swearing either occurs as you go out here, or happiness occurs, depending on what happened. This is, this would be the best situation if you connected all of those stations directly to the center of the hub, right? It's actually full of the hub, right? So uh, that would be a kind of a ridiculous railway system. We didn't make that. Uh, and this is the minimum one if you have a spanning tree. So this is, right, the, you have the minimum number of connections that you need. So you know about this from graph theory. So you have n nodes and n minus one connections. So this is just taking this guy and chopping out a few redundancies and so on. 
Uh, and then this is uh, this one is from a simulation that's in this paper, right? Trying to find the best fit. So you can see it's you know it's not so far away from this guy. And uh, you know, it's sort of lots of real networks, supply networks where there's a true hub. There's a true hub does this sort of thing. But Los Angeles is a bit different, right? It has a downtown which is there, and there's actually a subway and there's some stuff, right? That you know, no one knows is that. But um, but there's a lot of more spread out stuff, right? It has, a, you know, its density is much more uniform. There's a lot of different places to go to. Density, uh, DC is more like this. DC is kind of like this, where it just splits out where the middle. And they all come back here. There's a real pulse to the city. Yeah. Right. Uh, but the idea is again, you know, that it's not this, but it's not so far off this in terms of how far you have to go, right? So you don't you don't travel. All right. Uh, so one more piece that we'll throw in. Uh, I guess I just splash this up. So the, the, the cross-sectional area could vary as you as you move away from the source. And you could think about it either you're widening out. So if it widens out, that, that gives you that slowing down effect that we saw with Murray's law. Right? So if your tube gets wider, so you're all in the, you're all in together to start with, and you're like rushing through this tight spot, and then it opens up and you're like, oh. Right. So um, that's the second statement, right? The flow rate increases as, as cross-sectional area decreases or the opposite, it, it decreases as the area opens up. Uh, so you can imagine them tapering or spreading apart. Uh, the most sort of sensible thing is that they widen out. Um, yeah, so you can compute. So if you have this happening, right, you have there's some tapering or some expansion as you go away. This is some length of, this is the length of the network. There's some typical expansion here that's growing as a function of length. Um, and, okay, here's the story, right? So it's um, uh, radius of scaling is, and this is just a sort of things that explore length plus one, but basically it's decaying um, uh, from some maximum. Yeah, okay. But it's pretty, it's pretty slight. So you can compute the volume of the overall network, because that's what we're interested in. What flow is in this thing? How much stuff is in it? Uh, what's the computation? You don't have to worry about too much. But it's scaling um, as length of 1 minus 2 epsilon, instead of just length, which is what we said before. Right? We said that the tubes were all the same uh, thickness. That's what would happen if epsilon is equal to 0. Um, and it depends on epsilon. So if epsilon is actually uh, less than a half, you get this scaling. Greater than a half, it actually flips the other way, and uh, it's it's tapering so fast. So right, it's tapering so fast that in fact it, it kind of approaches uh, a constant because it goes. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. So that's just to add to some maths, and it keeps it all in a geometric story. Right? We're not actually going to talk about flow. It's just you know, there's some architecture to this network, and we'll sort of essentially encode the flow in. In its shape. Right. Okay, so I'll just how we do. Okay, so um, all right, so we're going to compute our network volume and uh, epsilon is a particular value here. So this is our estimate, right? So we have a density of of nodes of uh, sinks. So we put this guy in here. And we're going to multiply that density. Uh, maybe I can help you with this. So this is the length from the origin. We'll put the heart at the origin times uh, to the power of one minus two epsilon. And that's the that's this estimated volume of this this tube, right? So here's a here's this uh, center. We're in some shape. We're trying to get out to here. There's some uh, the tube is doing something like this, right? Uh, this Distance here is, I'm writing x as the uh, Pythagorean story, right? So that's the, the length of x, the modulus of x. And then, so that's that length. And then the volume in here is proportional to x to the 1 minus 2 epsilon. And that's so it's based on this tapering, on this ability to taper. And so if it's, yeah, again, if it's equal to 0, then we just get it's growing like that. Um, and out here, in fact, there's a little box. You think of it like this. There's a little box out here. 
right? It's dx1 this way, and dx2 this way, and dx3 this way. And so its volume is dx, I write it like this, with the dx1, dx2, dx3. And if you multiply that, so rho times dx is the approximate the number of sinks um, at this point x in that little box. Right, that's the little box. Yeah. And then all of those have to have their own little road getting to them, or their little tube things to them. So this is a number, this piece is a number, uh, rho times dx is a number, and then this is a volume, so number times volume. And then we're going to integrate over the whole shape, that's what this is, and this is to say it's a shape, a uh, particular shape given by omega. It uh, lives in a little d-dimensional space, but inside of an ambient big d-dimensional space. And it's something that scales, so we scale it up in here. Uh, you have a question there, you, go. you can look up the question. Okay. So you play with this thing, and you can show that um, it's proportional, so this density is independent of this detail here, is a, it can vary with volume. Uh, scales is v to the 1 plus the maximum of those little scaling exponents that each of the length scales had. Right? So if it was isometric again in three dimensions, this would be 1 third. We talked about some examples where it could be you know, a quarter or three, well, three-eighths, for example. Uh, and then this one minus two epsilon is sitting here as well. So it's the maximum of the, of the scaling exponents for the individual length scales. Um, and you get a different calculation if you start with um, epsilon greater than a half. You simply get that the, the volume of the network scales it, um, proportionally to the volume of the whole thing. It's really... Yeah, there's really nothing in these in these tubes. Okay. Uh, all right, so let's see. Yeah. So if you can, if they if they can taper really fast, that's basically what is happening here. Then the, then the network doesn't take up any volume at all. But that's a problem. It's not going to uh, fit anything. Okay. All right. So this is if you look at this, there's a power of one here. This is plus gamma two max. This is, a, this is a positive number, so there's some extra bit of stuff here. So it's growing a little faster than, than volume, potentially. Right? That's bad. Your network, if your network grows faster than your volume, then you're going to be in trouble. And some of you have seen this before. Right? So there's some calculations done like this. Years ago, uh, if you think about, say, a mouse having about 10% of its volume being blood, and then you scale up to an elephant, you'll have an elephant with 10 times its volume of being blood. So uh, you, you definitely don't want, when it comes to us, you do not want your uh, blood volume uh, scaling faster or slower than uh, your, your overall volume, right? That's not gonna work, right? We need, to, we need our elephant to have something like 10%, not zero, or 10,000%, that's not good. And, um, you know, it could be five, it could be eight, it could be 15, but it can't really scale, it can't move relative to the volume. All right. Um, uh, all right. Well, let me let me find myself a, a nice finishing point. Here. So, uh, okay. So we had. Uh, yep. This is this bit. Okay. So this is the, the first case. So volume is uh, the network volume scaling this way. As I said, there's a one plus something. So we have to treat that. So if scaling is isometric, we have one over d. Right? That's the little dimension. So again d equals 3, we get a third. Um, okay, this is one first result, and then next, on Tuesday, we'll, we'll dig into what happens when we have d equals 2 in, say, an ambient dimension of 3, or d equals 3 in an ambient dimension of 3. Um, interesting thing, right? So if scaling is uh, isometric, we get this. We just replace that by a little d there. Um, if it's allometric, we have some, let's call the maximum gamma allo, right? We'll call it this. And the point is it's greater than 1 over d. Right? The one, one length at least is scaling faster than the other. Okay. So we'll just sit it here. So that means if, if you look at this, this thing, this power here is greater than this power here. So that's an important result, right? If we take a ratio of these two guys, so this is the, ISO, the minimum volume that you need for your network, providing, you know, the Roads are basically going straight out, divided by the one you need for um, allometric, it's going to zero. 
You need less for the isometric shapes, isometrically growing shapes than allometric ones. So when we go back to that sphere becoming a pancake kind of thing, that thing is harder to supply, right? If that sphere just kept growing like a sphere, right, it gets up to something, has some volume, that's an e this should, in principle, make sense, I think. That, that should be an easier thing to supply than uh, the one that's kind of spreading out more, right? So let's say its uh, exponents are, but they have to, have to add up to one. Maybe you've got I don't know, 0.48 and 0.48 and 0.04. So it's really scaling very slowly this way, becoming a very flat um, cow. <laughs> it's really so this fun. is a stupid question. So if it's easier to supply isometric networks, why don't we grow isometrically? Why don't we? Okay, well, let me just say, embedded in this is that our cow. He's our cow, right? You're bad enough. Yeah. Right? I'm a moo cow. I'm a Okay, so, um, so we have our cow. It's becoming this two-dimensional thing, which I guess might be easier for consumption. But, uh, okay. It's more, it's it's more 2D-like. That's the thing. So think the higher the dimension. So here's the other sort The higher the dimension, as you go up, the easier it is to supply things. Things are more compact, right? So it's better to have a ten-dimensional kind of system than a three-dimensional one. And the allometric things, they're in between dimensions, right? The spherical cows are really three-dimensional. This guy is quasi two-dimensional. And that's a harder thing to supply. So why don't we grow Well, sometimes, you know, I mean, if it's cities, there's like the shape of the thing. You're on a coastline, maybe, you know, it's mountains and so on. Um, well, I think I think we kind of we do in a lot of cases actually. I think we kind of do. Yeah, I, I, that was the question. Oh. Obviously, there's other stuff going. Oh into well, it. yeah, no, no, it's fair <laughs> but I think we, I think we come pretty close to it for rivers actually, and we do for for, for uh, uh, mammal things, funny things with fur. Oh, <laughs> um, so there's more to add to this, but this I think is a nice yeah. piece to start with. Some really nice little calculations about surface area as well. You might want to think about. What, how is the surface area of this guy scaling versus the spherical cow? Is it better or worse? Right? Because surface area matters, right? You're giving off your heat through the surface. Right? So this is how you can find that cow, is because it gives off heat. You know, infrared stuff, right? So if you've got your binoculars on that night, you can uh, see, uh, see organisms, right? Okay. Uh, we tweet so the NSA can find the story. Anyway, so. Okay, so uh, we'll, we'll add to this as lots more fun. Okay, yeah, uh, on, on Tuesday and Thursday. And Thursday. Yeah. Mm. And we'll get to cartograms. Yeah, I think you had that.